Section 29 of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Regina Tippetts. A General View of Positivism by August Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Chapter 6 Conclusion The Religion of Humanity, Part 4. But while bearing in mind our debt to Catholicism, we need not omit to recognize how largely positivism gains by comparison with it. Full justice will be done to the aims of Catholicism and to the excellence of its results. But the whole effect of positivist worship will be to make men feel clearly how far superior in every respect is the synthesis founded on the love of humanity to that founded on the love of God. Christianity satisfied no part of our nature fully except the affections. It rejected imagination, it shrank from reason, and therefore its power was always contested and could not last. Even in its own sphere of affection, its principles never lent themselves to that social direction which the Catholic priesthood, with such remarkable persistency, endeavored to give them. The aim which it set before men, being unreal and personal, was ill-suited to a life of reality and of social sympathy. It is true that the universality of this supreme affection was indirectly a bond of union, but only when it was not at variance with true social feeling. And from the nature of the system, opposition between these two principles was the rule, and harmony the exception, since the love of God, even as viewed by the best Catholic types, required in almost all cases the abandonment of every other passion. The moral value of such a synthesis consisted solely in the discipline which it established, discipline of whatever kind being preferable to anarchy, which would have given free scope to all the lowest propensities. But notwithstanding all the tender feeling of the best mystics, the affection which to them was supreme admitted of no real reciprocity. Moreover, the stupendous nature of the reward and penalties by which every precept in this arbitrary system was enforced tended to weaken the character and to taint our noblest impulses. The essential merit of the system was that it was the first attempt to exercise systemic control over our moral nature. The discipline of polytheism was usually confined to actions. Sometimes it extended to habits, but it never touched the affections from which both habits and actions spring. Christianity took the best means of effecting its purpose that were then available, but it was not successful except so far as to give indirect encouragement to our higher feelings. And so vague and absolute were its principles that even this would have been impossible but for the wisdom of the priesthood who for a long time saved society from the dangers incident to so arbitrary a system. But at the close of the Middle Ages, when the priesthood became retrograde and lost at once their morality and freedom, the doctrine was left to its own impotence and rapidly degenerated till it became a chronic source of degradation and of discord. But the synthesis based upon love of humanity has too deep a foundation in positive truth to be liable to similar decline, and its influence cannot but increase so long as the progress of our race endures. The great being, who is its object, tolerates the most searching inquiry, and yet does not restrict the scope of imagination. The laws which regulate her existence are now known to us, and more deeply her nature is investigated, the stronger is our consciousness of her reality and the greatness of her benefits. The thought of her stimulates all powers of imagination, and thus enables us to participate in a measure in the universality of her life throughout the whole extent of time and space of which we have any real knowledge. All our real intellectual results, whether in art or science, are alike co-coordinated by the religion of humanity, for it furnishes the sole bond of connection by which permanent harmony can be established between our thoughts and our feelings. It is the only system which, without artifice and without arbitrary restriction, can establish the preponderance of affection over thought and action. It sets forth social feeling as the first principle of morality, without ignoring the natural superiority and strength of the personal instincts. To live for others it holds to be the highest happiness, to become incorporate with humanity, to sympathize with all her former phases, to foresee her destinies in the future, and to do what lies in us to forward them. This is what it puts before us as the constant aim of life. 
Self-love in the positive system is regarded as the great infirmity of our nature, an infirmity which unremitting discipline on the part of each individual and of society may materially palliate but will never radically cure. The degree to which this mastery over our nature is attained is the truest standard of individual or social progress, since it has the closest relation to the existence of the great being and to the happiness of the elements that compose it. Inspired as it is by sincere gratitude, which increases the more carefully the grounds for it are examined, the worship of humanity raises prayer for the first time above the degrading influence of self-interest. We pray to the Supreme Being, but only to express our deep thankfulness for her present and past benefits, which are an earnest of still greater blessings in the future. Doubtless it is a fact of human nature that habitual expression of such feelings reacts beneficially on our moral nature, and so far we too find in prayer a noble recompense. But it is one that can suggest to us no selfish thoughts, since it cannot come at all unless it comes spontaneously. Our highest happiness consists in love, and we know that more than any other feeling, love may be strengthened by exercise that alone all of our feelings it admits of and increases with simultaneous expansion in all. Humanity will become more familiar to us than the old gods were to the polytheists, yet without the loss of dignity which, in their case, resulted from familiarity. Her nature has in it nothing arbitrary, yet she cooperates with us in the worship that we render, since in honoring her we receive back grace for grace. Homage accepted by the deity of former times laid him open to the charge of puerile vanity, but the new deity will accept praise only where it is deserved, and will derive from it equal benefit with ourselves. This perfect reciprocity of affection and of influence is peculiar to positive religion, because in it alone the object of worship is a being whose nature is relative, modifiable, and perfectible, a being of whom her own worshippers form a part and the laws of whose existence being more clearly known than theirs allow her desires and her tendencies to be more distinctly foreseen superiority of positive morality the morality of positive religion combines all the advantages of spontaneousness with those of demonstration it is so thoroughly human in all its parts as to preclude all the subterfuges by which repentance for transgression is so often stifled or evaded. By pointing out distinctly the way in which each individual action reacts upon society, it forces us to judge our own conduct without lowering our standard. Some might think it too gentle and not sufficiently vigorous, yet the love by which it is inspired is no passive feeling but a principle which strongly stimulates our energies to the full extent compatible with the attainment of that highest good to which it is ever tending. Accepting the truths of science, it teaches that we must look to our own remitting activity for the only providence by which the rigor of our destiny can be elevated. We know well that the great organism, superior though it may be to all beings known to us, is yet under the dominion of inscrutable laws and is in no respect either absolutely perfect or absolutely secure from danger. Every condition of our existence, whether those of the external world or those of our own nature, might at some time be compromised. Even our moral and intellectual faculties, on which our highest interests depend, are no exception to this truth. Such contingencies are always possible, and yet they are not to prevent us from living nobly. They must not lessen our love, our thought, or our efforts for humanity. They must not overwhelm us with anxiety nor urge us to useless complaint. But the very principles which demand this high standard of courage and resignation are themselves well calculated to maintain it. For by making us fully conscious of the greatness of man, and by setting us free from the degrading influences of fear, they inspire us with keen interest in our efforts, inadequate though they be, against the pressure of fatalities which are not always beyond our power to modify. And thus the reaction of these fatalities upon our character is turned at last to a most beneficial use. It prevents alike overweening anxiety for our own interests and dull indifference to them, whereas in theological and metaphysical symptoms, even when inculcating self-denial, there is always a dangerous tendency to concentrate thought on personal considerations. Dignified reaction where modification of them is possible, such is the moral standard which positivism puts forward for individuals and for society.
catholicism notwithstanding the radical defects of its doctrine has unconsciously been influenced by the modern spirit and at the close of the middle ages was tending in a direction similar to that here described although its principles were inconsistent with any formal recognition of it it is only in the countries that have been preserved from protestantism that any traces are left of these faint efforts of the priesthood to rise above their own theories the catholic god would gradually change into a feeble and imperfect representation of humanity were not the clergy so degraded socially as to be unable to participate in the spontaneous feelings of the community it is a tendency too slightly marked to lead to any important result yet it is a striking proof of the new direction which men's minds and hearts are unconsciously taking in countries which are often supposed to be altogether left behind in the march of modern thought the clearest indication of it is in their acceptance of the worship of woman which is the first step towards the worship of humanity since the twelfth century the influence of the virgin especially in spain and italy has been constantly on the increase the priesthood have often protested against it but without effect and sometimes they have found it necessary to sanction it for the sake of preserving their authority the special and privileged adoration which this beautiful creation of poetry has received could not but produce a marked change in the spirit of catholicism it may serve as a connecting link between the religion of our ancestors and that of our descendants the virgin becoming gradually regarded as a personification of humanity little however will be done in this direction by the established priesthood whether in italy or spain we must look to the pure agency of women who will be the means of introducing positivism among our southern brethren all the points then in which the morality of positive science excels the morality of revealed religion are summed up in the substitution of love of humanity for love of god it is a principle as adverse to metaphysics as to theology since it excludes all personal considerations and places happiness whether for the individual or for the society in constant exercise of kindly feeling to love humanity may be truly said to constitute the whole duty of man provided it be clearly understood what such love really implies and what are the conditions required for maintaining it the victory of social feeling over our innate self-love is rendered possible only by a slow and difficult training of the heart in which the intellect must cooperate the most important part of this training consists in the mutual love of man and woman with all other family affections which precede and follow it but every aspect of morality even the personal virtues are included in love of humanity it furnishes the best measure of their relative importance and the surest method for laying down incontestable rules of conduct and thus we find the principles of systemic morality to be identical with those of spontaneous morality a result which renders positive doctrine equally accessible to all rise of the new spiritual power science therefore poetry and morality will alike be regenerated by the new religion and will ultimately form one harmonious whole on which the destinies of man will henceforth rest with women to whom the first germs of spiritual power are due this consecration of the rational and imaginative faculties to the source of feeling has always existed spontaneously but to realize it in social life it might be brought forward in a systemic form as part of general doctrine this is what the medieval system attempted upon the basis of monotheism a moral power arose composed of the two elements essential to such a power the sympathetic influence of women in the family the systemic influence of the priesthood on public life as a preliminary attempt the catholic system was most beneficial it could not last because the synthesis on which it rested was imperfect and unstable the catholic doctrine and worship address themselves exclusively to our emotional nature and even from the moral point of view their principles were uncertain and arbitrary the field of intellect whether in art or science as well as that of practical life would have been left almost untouched but for the personal character of the priests but with the loss of their political independence which had been always in danger from the military tendencies of the time the priesthood rapidly degenerated the system was in fact premature and even before the industrial era of modern times had set in the aesthetic and metaphysical growth of the times had already gone too far for its feeble power of control and it then became as hostile to progress as it had formerly been favorable to it moral qualities without intellectual superiority are not enough for a true spiritual power they will not enable it to modify to any appreciable extent the strong preponderance of material considerations consequently it is the primary condition of social reorganization to put an end to the state of utter revolt which the intellect maintains against the heart 
a state which existed ever since the close of the middle ages and the source of which may be traced as far back as the greek metaphysicians positivism has at last overcome the immense difficulties of this task its solution consists in the foundation of social science on the basis of the preliminary sciences so that at last there is unity of method in our conceptions our active faculties have always been guided by the positive spirit and by its extension to the sphere of feeling a complete synthesis alike spontaneous and systematic in its nature is constructed and every part of our nature is brought under the regenerating influence of the worship of humanity thus a new spiritual power will arise complete and homogeneous in structure coherent and at the same time progressive and better calculated than catholicism to engage the support of women which is so necessary to its efficient action on society temporal power will always be necessary but its action will be modified by the spiritual were it not for the material necessities of human life nothing further would be required for its guidance than a spiritual power such as is here described we should have in that case no need for any laborious exertion and universal benevolence would be looked upon as the sovereign good and would become the direct object of all our efforts all that would be necessary would be to call our reasoning powers and still more our imagination into play in order to keep this object constantly in view purely fictitious as such a hypothesis may be it is yet an ideal limit to which our actual life should be more and more nearly approximated as a utopia it is a fit subject for the poet and in his hands it will supply the new religion with resources far superior to any that christianity derived from vague and unreal pictures of future bliss in it we may carry out a more perfect social classification in which men may be ranked by moral and intellectual merit irrespectively of wealth or position for the only standard by which in such a state men could be tried would be their capacity to love and to please humanity such a standard will of course never be practically accepted and indeed the classification in question would be impossible to effect yet it should always be present to our minds and should be contrasted dispassionately with the actual arrangements of social rank with which power even where accidentally acquired has more to do than worth the priests of humanity with the assistance of women will avail themselves largely of this contrast in modifying the existing order positivist education will fully explain its moral validity and in our religious services appeal will frequently be made to it although an ideal abstraction yet being based on reality except so far as the necessities of daily life are concerned it will be far more efficacious than the vague and uncertain classification founded on the theological doctrine of a future state when society learns to admit no other providence than its own it will go far in adopting this ideal classification as to produce a strong effect on the classes who are the best aware of its impracticability but those who press this contrast must be careful always to respect the natural laws which regulate the distribution of wealth and rank they have a definitive social function and that function is not to be destroyed but to be improved and regulated in order therefore to reconcile these conditions we must limit our ideal classification to individuals leaving the actual subordination of office and position unaffected well-marked personal superiority is not very common and society would be wasting its powers in useless and interminable controversy if it undertook to give each function to its best organ thus dispossessing the former functionary without taking into account the conditions of practical experience even in the spiritual hierarchy where it is easier to judge of merit such a course would be utterly subversive of discipline but there would be no political danger and morally there would be great advantage in pointing out all remarkable cases which illustrate the difference between the order of rank and the order of merit respect may be shown to be noblest without compromising the authority of the strongest st bernard was esteemed more highly than any of the popes of his time yet he remained in the humble position of an abbot and never failed to show the perfect deference for the higher functionaries of the church a still more striking example was furnished by st paul in recognizing the official superiority of st peter of whose moral and mental inferiority to himself he must have been well aware all organized corporations civil or military can show instances on a less important scale where the abstract order of merit has been adopted consistently with the concrete order of rank 
where this is the case the two may be contrasted without any subversive consequences the contrast will be morally beneficial to all classes at the same time that it proves the imperfection to which so complicated an organism as human society must be ever liable thus the religion of humanity creates an intellectual and moral power which could human life be freed from the pressure of material wants would suffice for its guidance imperfect as our nature assuredly is yet social sympathy has an intrinsic charm which would make it paramount but for the imperious necessities by which the instincts of self-preservation are stimulated so urgent are they that the greater part of life is necessarily occupied with actions of a self-regarding kind before which reason imagination and even feeling have to give way consequently this moral power which seems so well adapted for the direction of society must only attempt to act as a modifying influence its sympathetic element in other words women accept this necessity without difficulty for true affection always takes the right course of action as soon as it is clearly indicated but the intellect is far more unwilling to take a subordinate position its rash ambition is far more unsettling to the world than the ambition of rank and wealth against which it so often inveighs it is the hardest of social problems to regulate the exercise of the intellectual powers while securing them their due measure of influence the object being that theoretical power should be able really to modify and yet should never be permitted to govern for the nations of antiquity this problem was insoluble with them the intellect was always either a tyrant or a slave the solution was attempted in the middle ages but without success owing to the military and theological character of the times positivism relies for solving it on the reality which is one of its principal features and on the fact that society has now entered on its industrial phase based on accurate inquiry into the past and future destinies of man its aim is so to regenerate our political action as to transform it ultimately into a practical worship of humanity morality being the worship rendered by the affections science and poetry that rendered by the intellect such is the principal mission of the occidental priesthood a mission in which women and the working classes will actively cooperate end of section twenty nine section thirty of a general view of positivism this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by melvin lee a general view of positivism by auguste comte translated by john henry bridges chapter six conclusion the religion of humanity part five substitution of duties for rights the most important object of this regenerated polity will be the substitution of duties for rights thus subordinating personal to social considerations the word right should be excluded from political language as the word cause from the language of philosophy both are theological and metaphysical conceptions and the former is as immoral and subversive as the latter is unmeaning and sophistical both are alike incompatible with the final state and their value during the revolutionary period of modern history has simply consisted in their solvent action upon previous systems rights in the strict sense of the word are possible only so long as power is considered as emanating from a superhuman will rights under all theological systems were divine but in their opposition to theocracy the metaphysicians of the last five centuries introduced what they called the rights of man a conception the value of which consisted simply in its destructive effects whenever it has been taken as the basis of constructive policy its antisocial character and its tendency to strengthen individualism have always been apparent in the positive state where no supernatural claims are admissible the idea of right will entirely disappear every one has duties duties towards all but rights in the ordinary sense can be claimed by none whatever security the individual may require is found in the general acknowledgment of reciprocal obligations 
and this gives a moral equivalent for rights as heretofore claimed without the serious political dangers which they involved in other words no one has any case any right but that of doing his duty the adoption of this principle is the one way of realizing the grand ideal of the middle ages the subordination of politics to morals in these times however the vast bearings of the question were but very imperfectly apprehended its solution is incompatible with every form of theology and is only to be found in positivism the solution consists in regarding our political and social action as the service of humanity its object should be to assist by conscious effort all functions whether relating to order or to progress which humanity has hitherto performed spontaneously this is the ultimate object of positive religion without it all other aspects of that religion would be inadequate and would soon cease to have any value true affection does not stop short at desire for good it strains every effort to attain it the elevation of soul arising from the act of contemplating and adoring humanity is not the sole object of religious worship above and beyond this there is the motive of becoming better able to serve humanity unceasing action on our part being necessary for her preservation and development this indeed is the most distinctive feature of positive religion the supreme being of former times had really little need of human services the consequence was that with all theological believers and with monotheists especially devotion always tended to denigrate into quietism the danger could only be obviated when the priesthood had sufficient wisdom to take advantage of the vagueness of these theories and to draw from them motives for practical exertion nothing could be done in this direction unless the priesthood retained their social independence as soon as this was taken from them by the usurpation of temporal power the more sincere amongst catholics lapsed into the quietistic spirit which for a long time had been kept in check in positivism on the contrary the doctrine itself irrespective of the character of its teachers is a direct and continuous incentive to exertion of every kind the reason for this is to be found in the relative and dependent nature of our supreme being of whom her own worshippers form a part consensus of the social organism in this which is the essential service of humanity and which infuses a religious spirit into every act of life the feature most prominent is cooperation of effort cooperation on so vast a scale that less complicated organisms have nothing to compare with it the consensus of the social organism extends to time as well as space hence the two distinct aspects of social sympathy the feeling of solidarity or union with the present and of continuity or union with the past careful investigation of any social phenomenon whether relating to order or to progress always proves convergence direct or indirect of all contemporaries and of all former generations within certain geographical and chronological limits and those limits recede as the development of humanity advances in our thoughts and feelings such convergence is unquestionable and it should be still more evident in our actions the efficacy of which depends on cooperations to a still greater degree here we feel how false as well as immoral is the notion of right a word which as commonly used implies absolute individuality the only principle on which politics can be subordinated to morals is that individuals should be regarded not as so many distinct beings but as organs of one supreme being indeed in all settled states of society the individual has always been considered as a public functionary filling more or less efficiently a definite post whether formally appointed to it or not 
so fundamental a principle has ever been recognized instinctively up to the period of revolutionary transition which is now at length coming to an end a period in which the obstructive and corrupt character of organized society roused a spirit of anarchy which though at first favorable to progress has now become an obstacle to it positivism however will place this principle beyond reach of attack by giving a systematic demonstration of it based on the sum of our scientific knowledge continuity of the past with the present in this demonstration will be the intellectual basis on which the moral authority of the new priesthood will rest what they have to do is to show the dependence of each important question as it arises upon social cooperation and by this means to indicate the right path of duty for this purpose all their scientific knowledge and aesthetic power will be needed otherwise social feeling could never be developed sufficiently to produce any strong effect upon conduct it would never that is go further than the feelings of mere solidarity with the present which is only its incipient and rudimentary form we see this unfortunate narrowism of view too often in the best socialists who leaving the present without roots in the past would carry us headlong towards a future of which they have no definite conception in all social phenomena and especially in those of modern times the participation of our predecessors is greater than that of our contemporaries the truth is especially apparent in industrial undertakings for which the combination of efforts required is so vast it is our affiliation with the past even more than our connection with the present which teaches us that the only real life is the collective life of the race that individual life has no existence except as an abstraction continuity is the feature which distinguishes our race from all others many of the lower races are able to form a union among their living members but it was reserved for man to conceive and realize cooperation of successive generations the source to which the gradual growth of civilization is to be traced social sympathy is a barren and imperfect feeling and indeed it is a cause of disturbance so long as it extends no further than the present time it is a disregard for historical continuity which induces that mistaken antipathy to all forms of inheritance which is now so common scientific study of history would soon convince those of our socialist writers who are sincere of their radical error in this respect if they were more familiar with the collective inheritance of society the value of which no one can seriously dispute they would feel less objection to inheritance in its application to individuals or families practical experience moreover bringing them into contact with the facts of the case will gradually show them that without the sense of continuity with the past they cannot really understand their solidarity with the present for in the first place each individual in the course of his growth passes spontaneously through phases corresponding in a great measure to those of our historical development and therefore without some knowledge of the history of society he cannot understand the history of his own life again each of these successive phases may be found amongst the less advanced nations who do not as yet share in the general progress of humanity so that we cannot properly sympathize with these nations if we ignore the successive stages of development in western europe the nobler socialists and communists those especially who belong to the working classes will soon be alive to the error and danger of these inconsistencies and will supply this deficiency in their education which at present vitiates their efforts with women the purest and most spontaneous element of the moderating power the priests of humanity will find it less difficult to introduce the broad principles 
of historical science. They are more inclined than any other class to recognize our continuity with the past being themselves its original source. Necessity of a spiritual power to study and teach these truths, and thus to govern men by persuasion instead of by compulsion. Without a scientific basis, therefore, a basis which must itself rest on the whole sum of positive speculation, it is impossible for our social sympathies to develop themselves fully, so as to extend not to the present only, but also and still more strongly to the past. And this is the first motive, a motive founded alike on moral and on intellectual considerations, for the separation of temporal from spiritual power in the final organization of society. The more vigorously we concentrate our efforts upon social progress, the more clearly shall we feel the impossibility of modifying social phenomenon without knowledge of the laws that regulate them. This involves the existence of an intellectual class specifically devoted to the study of social phenomena. Such a class will be invested with the consultative authority for which their knowledge qualifies them, and also with the function of teaching necessary for the diffusion of their principles. In the minor arts of life it is generally recognized that principles should be investigated and taught by thinkers who are not concerned in applying them. In the art of social life, so far more difficult and important than any other, the separation of theory from practice is of far greater moment. The wisdom of such a course is obvious, and all opposition to it will be overcome, as soon as it becomes generally recognized that social phenomena are subject to invariable laws, laws of so complicated a character and so dependent upon other sciences as to make it doubly necessary that minds of the highest order should be specially devoted to their interpretation. But there is another aspect of the question of not less importance in sound polity. Separation of temporal from spiritual power is as necessary for free individual activity as for social cooperation. Humanity is characterized by the independence as well as the convergence of the individuals or families of which she is composed. The latter condition, convergence, is that which secures order, but the former is no less essential to progress. Both are alike urgent. Yet in ancient times they were incompatible, for the reason that spiritual and temporal power were always in the same hands, in the hands of the priests in some cases, and at other times in those of the military chief. As long as the state held together, the independence of the individual was habitually sacrificed to the convergence of the body politic. This explains why the conception of progress never arose, even in the minds of the most visionary schemers. The two conditions were irreconcilable until the Middle Ages, when a remarkable attempt was made to separate the modifying power from the governing power, and so to make politics subordinate to morals. Cooperation of efforts was now placed on a different footing. It was the result of free assent rendered by the heart and understanding to a religious system which laid down general rules of conduct in which nothing was arbitrary and which were applied to governors as strictly as to their subjects. The consequence was that Catholicism, notwithstanding its extreme defects intellectually and socially, produced moral and political results of very great value. Chivalry arose a type of life in which the most vigorous independence was combined with the most intense devotion to a common cause. Every class in Western society was elevated by this union of personal dignity with universal brotherhood. So well is human nature adapted for this combination that it arose under the first religious system of which the principles were not incompatible with it. With the necessary decay of that religion, it became seriously impaired, but yet was preserved instinctively, especially in countries untouched by Protestantism. By it, the medieval system prepared the way for the conception of humanity, 
since it put an end to the fatal opposition in which the two characteristic attributes of humanity, independence and cooperation, had hitherto existed. Catholicism brought unity into theological religion, and by doing so led to its decline, but it paved the way long beforehand for the more complete and more real principle of unity on which human society will be finally organized. But meritorious and useful as this premature attempt was, it was no real solution to the problem. The spirit and temper of the period were not ripe for any definite solution. Theological belief and military life were alike inconsistent with any permanent separation of theoretical and practical powers. It was maintained only for a few centuries precariously and inadequately by a sort of natural balance or rather oscillation between imperialism and theocracy. But the positive spirit and the industrial character of modern times tend naturally to this division of power, and when it is consciously recognized as a principle, the difficulty of reconciling cooperation with independence will exist no longer, for in the first place, the rules to which human conduct will be subjected will rest, as in Catholic times, but to a still higher degree upon persuasion and conviction, instead of compulsion. Again, the fact of the new faith being always susceptible of demonstration renders the spiritual system based on it more elevating as well as more durable. The rules of Catholic morality were only saved from being arbitrary by the introduction of supernatural will as a substitute for mere human authority. The plan had undoubtedly many advantages, but liberty in the true sense was not secured by it, since the rules remained as before without explanation. It was only their source that was changed. Still less successful was the subsequent attempt of metaphysicians to prove that submission to government was the foundation of virtue. It was only a return to the old system of arbitrary wills, stripped of the theocratic sanction to which all its claims to respect and its freedom from caprice had been due. The only way to reconcile independence with social union and thereby to reach true liberty lies in obedience to the objective laws of the world and of human nature. Clearing these, as far as possible, of all that is subjective, and thus rendering them amenable to scientific demonstration, of such immense consequence to society will it be to extend the scientific method to the complex and important phenomena of human nature. Man will no longer be the slave of man. He yields only to external law, and to this those who demonstrate it to him are as submissive as himself. In such obedience there can be no degradation even where the laws are inflexible. But, as positivism shows us, in most cases they are modifiable, and in this especially in the case of our mental and moral constitution. Consequently, our obedience is here no longer passive obedience. It implies the devotion of every faculty of our nature to the improvement of a world of which we are in a true sense masters. The natural laws to which we owe submission furnish the basis for our intervention. They direct our efforts and give stability to our purpose. The more perfectly they are known, the more free will our conduct become from arbitrary command or servile obedience. True, our knowledge of these laws will very seldom attain such precision as to enable us to do altogether without compulsory authority. When the intellect is inadequate, the heart must take its place. There are certain rules of life for which it is difficult to assign the exact ground, and where affection must assist reason in supplying motives for obedience. Wholly to dispense with arbitrary authority is impossible, nor will it degrade us to submit to it, provided that it be always regarded as secondary to the uniform supremacy of external laws and that every step in the development of our mental or moral powers shall restrict its employment. Both conditions are evidently satisfied 
in the positive system of life. The tendency of modern industry and science is to make us less dependent on individual caprice, as well as more assimilable to the universal organism. Positism, therefore, secures the liberty and dignity of man by its demonstration that social phenomena, like all others, are subject to natural laws, which within certain limits are modifiable by wise action on the part of society. Totally contrary, on the other hand, is the spirit of metaphysical schemes of polity, in which society is supposed to have no spontaneous impulses, and is handed over to the will of the legislator. In these degrading and oppressive schemes, union is purchased, as in ancient times at the cost of independence. In these two ways, then, positive religion influences the practical life of humanity, in accordance with the natural laws that regulate her existence. First, the sense of solidarity with the present is perfected by adding to it the sense of continuity with the past. Secondly, the cooperation of her individual agents is rendered compatible with their independence. Not till this is done can politics become really subordinate to morals and the feeling of duty be substituted for that of right. Our active powers will be modified by the combined influence of feeling and reason as expressed in indisputable rules which it will be for the spiritual power to make known to us. Temporal government, whoever its administrators may be, will always be modified by morality, whereas in all metaphysical systems of polity nothing is provided for but the modes of access to government and the limits of its various departments. No principles are given to direct its application or to enable us to form a right judgment of it. End of section 30. Section 31 of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Chapter 6. Conclusion. The Religion of Humanity. Part 6. From this view of the practical side of the religion of humanity, taken in connection with its intellectual and moral side, we may form a general conception of the final reorganization of political institutions, by which alone the great revolution can be brought to a close. But the time for effecting the reconstruction has not yet come. There must be a previous reconstruction of opinions and habits of life upon the basis laid down by positivism, and for this at least one generation is required. In the interval, all political measures must retain their provincial character, although in framing them the final stage is always to be taken into account as yet nothing can be said to have been established except the moral principle on which positivism rests the subordination of politics to morals for this is in fact implicitly involved in the proclamation of a republic in france a step which cannot now be recalled and which implies that each citizen is to devote all his faculties to the service of humanity but with regard to the social organization by which alone this principle can be carried into effect although its bases have been laid down by positivism it has not yet reached the sanction of the public it may be hoped however that the motto which i have put forward as descriptive of the new political philosophy order and progress will soon be adopted spontaneously in the first or negative phase of the revolution all that was done was utterly to repudiate the old political system no indication whatever was given of the state of things which was to succeed it the motto of the time liberty and equality is an exact representation of this state of things the conditions expressed in it being utterly contradictory and incompatible with organization of any kind 
for obviously liberty gives free scope to superiority of all kinds and especially to moral and mental superiority so that if a uniform level of equality is insisted on freedom of growth is checked yet inconsistent as the motto was it was admirably adapted to the destructive temper of the time a time when hatred of the past compensated the lack of insight into the future it had too a progressive tendency which partly neutralized its subversive spirit it inspired the first attempt to derive true principles of polity from general views of history the memorable though unsuccessful essay of my great predecessor condorcet thus the first intimation of the future influence of the historical spirit was given at the very time when the anti-historical spirit had reached its climax the long period of reaction which succeeded the first crisis gave rise to no political motto of any importance it was a period for which men of any vigor of thought and character could not but feel secret repugnance it produced however a universal conviction that the metaphysical policy of the revolutionists was of no avail for constructive purposes and it gave rise to the historical works of the neo-catholic school which prepared the way for positivism by giving the first fair appreciation of the middle ages but the counter-revolution began begun by robespierre carried to its full length by bonaparte and continued by the bourbons came to an end in the memorable outbreak of eighteen thirty a natural period of eighteen years followed and a new motto liberty and public order was temporarily adopted this motto was very expressive of the political condition of the time and the more so that it arose spontaneously without ever receiving any formal sanction it expressed the general feeling of the public who feeling that the secret of the political future was possessed by none of the existing parties contented itself with pointing out the two conditions essential as a preparation for it it was an improvement on the first motto because it indicated more clearly that the ultimate purpose of the revolution was construction it got rid of the antisocial notion of equality all the moral advantages of equality without its political danger existed already in the feeling of fraternity which since the middle ages has become sufficiently diffused in western europe to need no special formula again this motto introduced empirically the great conception of order understanding it of course in the limited sense of material order at home and abroad no deeper meaning was likely to be attached to the word in a time of such mental and moral anarchy but with the adoption of the republican principle in eighteen forty eight the utility of this provisional motto ceased for the revolution now entered upon its positive phase which indeed for all philosophical minds had been already inaugurated by my discovery of the laws of social science but the fact of its having fallen into disuse is no reason for going back to the old motto liberty and equality which since the crisis of seventeen eighty nine has ceased to be appropriate in the utter absence of social convictions it has obtained a sort of official resuscitation but this will not prevent men of good sense and right feeling from adopting spontaneously the motto order and progress as a principle of all political action for the future in the second chapter i dwelt at some length upon this motto and pointed out its political and philosophical meaning i have now only to show its connection with the other mottoes of which we have been speaking and the probability of its adoption each of them like all combinations whether in the moral or physical world is composed of two elements and the last has one of its elements in common with the second as the second has in common with the first moreover liberty the element common to the two first is in reality contained in the third since all progress implies liberty but order is put foremost because the word is here intended to cover the whole field that properly belongs to it it includes things private as well as public 
intended to cover theoretical as well as practical moral as well as political progress is put next at the end of which order exists and as the mode in which it should be manifested this conception for which the crisis of seventeen eighty nine prepared the way will be our guiding principle throughout the constructive phase of the western revolution the reconciliation of order and progress which had hitherto been impossible is now an accepted fact for all advanced minds for the public this is not yet the case but since the close of the counter-revolution in eighteen thirty all minds have been tending unconsciously in this direction the tendency becomes still more striking by contrast with its opposite movement the increasing identity of principles between the reactionary and the anarchist schools but even if we suppose accomplished what is yet to be in prospect even if the fundamental principle of our future polity were accepted and publicly ratified by the adoption of this motto yet permanent reconstruction of political institutions would still be premature before this can be attempted the spiritual interregnum must be terminated for this object in which all hearts and minds especially among the working class and among women must unite their efforts with those of the philosophic priesthood at least one generation is required during this period governmental policy should be avowedly provisional its one object should be to maintain what is essential to our state of transition order at home and abroad here too positivism suffices for the task by explaining on historical principles the stage that we have left and that at which we shall ultimately arrive it enables us to understand the character of the intermediate stage the solution of the problem consists in a new revolutionary government adapted to the positive phase of the revolution as the admirable institutions of the convention were to its negative phase the principal features of such a government would be perfect freedom of speech and discussion and at the same time political preponderance of the central authority with proper guarantees for its future to secure perfect freedom of discussion various measures would be taken all penalties and fines which at present hamper its action would be abolished the only check left being the obligation of signature again all difficulties in the way of criticizing the private character of public men due to the disgraceful legislation of the psychologists would be removed lastly all official grants to theological and metaphysical institutions would be discontinued for while these remain freedom of instruction in the true sense cannot be said to exist with such substantial guarantees there will be little fear of reactionary tendencies on the part of the executive and consequently no danger in allowing it to take that ascendancy over the electoral body which in the present state of mental and moral anarchy is absolutely necessary for the maintenance of material order on this plan the french assembly would be reduced to about two hundred members and its duty only would be to vote the budget proposed by the finance committee of government and to audit accounts of the past year all executive or legislative measures would come within the province of the central power the only condition being that they should first be submitted to free discussion whether by journals public meetings or individual thinkers though such discussion should not bind the government legally the progressive character of the government thus guaranteed we have next to see that the men who compose it shall be such as are likely to carry out the provisional and purely practical purpose with which it is instituted on positive principles it is to the working classes that we should look for the only statesmen worthy of succeeding to the statesmen of the convention three of such men would be required for the central government they would combine the functions of a ministry with those of monarchy one of them taking the direction of foreign affairs another of home affairs the third of finance 
they would convoke and dissolve the electoral power on their own responsibility of this body the majority would in short time without any law to that effect consist of the larger capitalists for the office would be gratuitous and the duties would be of a kind which for their ordinary avocations fitted them changes would occasionally be necessary in the central government but since it would consist of three persons its continuity might be maintained and the tradition of the previous generation as well as the tendencies of the future and the position actually existing might all be represented such a government though of course retaining some revolutionary features would come as near to the normal state as it is at present practicable for its province would be entirely limited to material questions and the only anomaly of importance would be the fact of choosing rulers from the working classes normally this class is excluded from political administration which falls ultimately into the hands of capitalists but the anomaly is so obviously dependent simply on the present condition of affairs and will be so restricted in its application that the working classes are not likely to be seriously demoralized by it the primary object being to infuse morality into practical life it is clear that working men whose minds and hearts are peculiarly accessible to moral influence are for the present best qualified for political power no check meantime is placed on the action of the capitalists and this provisional policy prepares the way for their ultimate accession to power by convincing them of the urgent need of private and public regeneration without which they can never be worthy of it by this course too it becomes easier to bring the consultative influence of a spiritual power to bear upon modern government at first such influence can only be exercised spontaneously but it will become more and more systematic with every step of the great philosophical renovation on which the final reorganization of society is based the propriety of the provisional policy here recommended is further illustrated by the wide scope of its application although suggested by the difficulties peculiar to the position of france it is equally adapted to other nations who are sufficiently advanced to take part in the great revolutionary crisis thus the second phase of the revolution is at once distinguished from the first by having an occidental as opposed to a purely national character and the fact of the executive government being composed of working men points in the same direction since of all classes working men are the most free from local prejudices and have the strongest tendencies both intellectually and morally to universal union even should this form of government be limited for some few years to france it would be enough to remodel the old system of diplomacy throughout the west such are the advantages which the second revolutionary government will derive from the possession of systematic principles whereas the government of the convention was left to its empirical instincts and had nothing but its progressive instincts to guide it a special report was published in eighteen forty eight by the positivist society in which the subject of provisional government will be found discussed in greater detail quiet at home and peace abroad being secured we shall be able notwithstanding the continuance of mental and moral anarchy to proceed actively with the vast work of social regeneration with the certainty of full liberty of thought and expression for this purpose it will be desirable to institute the philosophical and political association to which i alluded to in the last volume of my positive philosophy published in eighteen forty two under the title of positive occidental committee its sittings would usually be held in paris and it would consist in the first place of eighteen frenchmen seven englishmen six germans five italians and four spaniards this would be enough to represent fairly the principal divisions of each population germany for instance might send a dutchman 
a prussian a swede a dane a bavarian and an austrian so too the italian members might come respectively from piedmont lombardy tuscany the roman states and the two sicilies again catalonia castile andalusia and portugal would adequately represent the spanish peninsula thus we should have a sort of permanent council of the new church each of the three elements of the moderating power would be admitted into it and it might also contain such members of the governing class as were sufficiently regenerated to be of use in forwarding the general movement there should be practical men in this council as well as philosophers here as elsewhere it will be principally from the working classes that such practical cooperation will come but no support if given sincerely will be rejected even should it emanate from the classes who are destined to extinction it is also most important for the purposes of this council that the third element of the moderating power women should be included in it so as to represent the fundamental principle of the preponderance of the heart over the understanding six ladies should be chosen in addition to the thirty members above mentioned of these two would be french and one from each of the other nations besides their ordinary sphere of influence it will be their special duty to disseminate positivism among the southern brethren it is an office that i had reserved for my saintly colleague who but for her premature death would have rendered eminent service in such a council End of section 31section thirty two of a general view of positivism this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a general view of positivism by auguste comte translated by john henry bridges chapter six conclusion of the religion of humanity while material order is maintained by national governments the members of the council as pioneers of the final order of society will be carrying on the european movement and gradually terminating the spiritual interregnum which is now the sole obstacle to social regeneration they will forward the development and diffusion of positivism and make practical application of its principles in all ways that are honorably open to them instruction of all kinds oral or written popular or philosophic will fall within their province but their chief aim will be to inaugurate the worship of humanity so far as that is possible and already a beginning is possible so far at least as the system of commemoration is concerned politically they may give a direct proof of the international character of the positive system by bringing forward several measures the utility of which has long been recognized but which have been neglected for want of some central authority placed beyond the reach of national rivalry one of the most important of such measures would be the establishment of a western naval force with the twofold object of protecting the seas and of assisting geographical and scientific discovery it should be recruited and supported from all five branches of the occidental family and would thus be a good substitute for the admirable institution of maritime chivalry which fell with catholicism on its flag the positivist motto should naturally be inscribed and thus would be for the first time publicly recognized another measure conceived in the same spirit would soon follow one which has long been desired but which owing to the anarchy prevalent throughout the west since the decline of catholicism has never yet been carried out a common monetary standard will be established with the consent of the various governments by which industrial transactions will be greatly facilitated three spheres made respectively of gold silver and platinum and each weighing fifty grams would differ sufficiently in value for the purpose 
the sphere should have a small flattened base and on the great circle parallel to it the positivist motto would be inscribed at the pole would be the image of the immortal charlemagne the founder of the western republic and round the image his name would be engraved in its latin form carolus that name respected as it is by all nations of europe alike would be the common appellation of the universal monetary standard the adoption of such measures would soon bring the positivist committee into favour many others might be suggested relating directly to its fundamental purpose which need not be specifically mentioned here i will only suggest the foundation by voluntary effort of an occidental school to serve as the nucleus of a true philosophic class the students would ultimately enter the positivist priesthood they would in most instances come from the working classes without however excluding real talent from whatever quarter by their agency this septennial course of positivist teaching might be introduced in all places disposed to receive it they would besides supply voluntary missionaries who would preach the doctrine everywhere even outside the limits of western europe according to the plan hereafter to be explained the travels of positivist workmen in the ordinary duties of their calling would greatly facilitate this work a more detailed view of this provisional system of instructions will be found in the second edition of the report on the subject of a positivist school published by the positivist society in eighteen forty nine there is another step which might be taken relating merely to the period of transition but also to the normal state a flag suitable to the western republic must be adopted which with slight alterations would also be the flag for each nation the want of such a symbol is already instinctively felt what is wanted is a substitute for the old retrograde symbols which yet shall avoid all subversive tendencies it would be a suitable inauguration for the period of transition which we are now entering if the colors and models appropriate to the final state were adopted at its outset to speak first of the banner to be used in religious services it would be painted on canvas on one side the ground would be white on it would be the symbol of humanity personified by a woman of thirty years of age bearing her son in her arms on the other side would bear the religious formula of positivists love is our principle order is our basis progress our end upon a ground of green the color of hope and therefore most suitable for emblems of the future green too would be the color of the political flag common to the whole west as it is intended to float freely it does not admit of painting but the canvas image of humanity might be placed at the banner pole the principal motto of positivism will in this case be divided into two both alike significant one side of the flag will have the political and scientific motto order and progress the other the moral and ascetic motto live for others the first will be preferred by men the other is more especially adapted to women who are thus invited to participate in these public manifestations of social feeling this point settled the question of the various national flags becomes easy in these the centre might be green and the national colours might be displayed on the border thus in france where the innovation will be first introduced the border will be tricolor with the present arrangement of colors except that more space should be given to the white in honor of our old royal flag in this way uniformity would be combined with variety and moreover it would be shown that the new feeling of occidentality is perfectly compatible with respect for the smallest nationalities each would retain the old signs in combination with the symbol the same principle would apply to all emblems of minor importance the question of these symbols of which i have spoken during the last two years in my weekly courses of lectures illustrates the most immediate of the functions to which the positivist committee will be called 
i mention it here as a type of its general action upon european society without setting any limits to the gradual increase of the association it is desirable that the main nucleus should always remain limited to the original number of thirty-six with two additions which will shortly be mentioned each member might institute a more numerous association in its own country and this again might be the parent of others associations thus affiliated may be developed to an unlimited extent and thus may be able to maintain the unity and homogeneity of the positivist church without impairing its coherence and vigor as soon as positivism has gained in every country a sufficient number of voluntary adherents to constitute the preponderating section of the community the regeneration of society is secured the numbers assigned above for the different nations only represent the order in which the advanced minds in each will cooperate in the movement the order in which the great body of each nation will join it will be as far as we can judge from their antecedents somewhat different the difference is that italy here takes the second place and spain the third while england descends to the last the grounds for this important modification are indicated in the third edition of my positive calendar they will be discussed in detail in the fourth volume of this treatise from europe the movement will spread ultimately to the whole race but the first step in its progress will naturally be to the inhabitants of our colonies who though politically independent of western europe still retain their affiliation with it twelve colonial members will be added to the council four for each american continent two for india two for the dutch and spanish possessions in the indian ocean this gives us forty-eight members to these twelve foreign associations will gradually be added to represent the population whose growth has been retarded and then the council will have received its full complement for every nation of the world is destined for the same ultimate conditions of social regeneration as ourselves the only difference being that western europe under the leadership of france takes the initiative it is of great importance not to attempt this final extension too soon an air which would impair the precision and vigor of the renovating movement at the same time it must never be forgotten that the existence of the great being remains incomplete until all its members are brought into harmonious cooperation in ancient times social sympathy was restricted to the idea of nationality between christendom or occidentality the real bearing of which is at present but little appreciated it will be our first political duty to revive that conception and place it on a firmer basis by terminating the anarchy consequent on the extinction of catholic feudalism while occupied in this task we shall become impressed with the conviction that the union of western europe is but a preliminary step to the union of humanity an instinctive presentiment of which has existed from the infancy of our race but which as long as theological belief and military life were predominant could never be carried out even in thought the primary laws of human development which form the philosophical basis of the positive system apply necessarily to all climates and races whatsoever the only difference being in the rapidity with which evolution takes place the inferiority of other nations in this respect is not inexplicable and it will now be compensated by a growth in greater regularity than ours and less interrupted by shocks and oscillations obviously in our case systematic guidance was impossible since it is only now that our growth is complete that we can learn the general laws common to it and to other cases wise and generous intervention of the west on behalf of our sister nations who are less developed will form a noble field for social art when based on sound scientific principles relative without being arbitrary zealous and yet always temperate 
such should be the spirit of this intervention and thus conducted it will form a system of moral and political action far nobler than the proselytism of theology or the extension of military empire the time will come when it will engage the whole attention of the positive council but for the present it must remain secondary to other subjects of greater urgency the first to join the western movement will necessarily be the remaining portion of the white race which in all its branches is superior to the other two races there are two monotheist nations and one polytheist which will be successively incorporated taken together the three represent the propagation of positivism in the east the vast population of the russian empire was left outside the pale of catholic feudalism by virtue of its christianity however notwithstanding its entire confusion of temporal and spiritual power it holds the first place among the monotheistic nations of the east its initiation into the western movement will be conducted by two nations of intermediate position greece connected with russia by the tie of religion and poland united with her politically though neither of these nations is homogeneous in structure with russia it would cause serious delay in the propagation of positivism should the connection be altogether terminated the next step will be to mohammedan monotheism first in turkey afterwards in persia here positivism will find points of sympathy of which catholicism could not admit indeed these are already perceptible arab civilization transmitted greek science to us and this will always secure for it an honourable place among the essential elements of the medieval system regarded as a preparation for positivism lastly we come to the polytheists of india and with them the incorporation of the white race will be complete already we see some spontaneous tendencies in this direction although from exceptional causes theocracy has been preserved in india there exist real points of contact with positivism and in this respect the assistance of persia will be of service it is the peculiar privilege of the positive doctrine that taking so complete a view of human development it is always able to appreciate the most ancient forms of social life at their true worth in these three stages of positivist propagation the council will have elected the first half of its foreign associates admitting successively a greek a russian an egyptian a turk a persian and finally a hindu the yellow race has adhered firmly to polytheism but it has been considerably modified in all its branches by monotheism either in the christian or mohammedan form to some extent therefore it is prepared for further change and a sufficient number of adherents may soon be obtained in tartary china japan and malacca to be presented in the council with one last addition the organization of the council is complete the black race has yet to be included it should send two representatives one from haiti which had the energy to shake off the iniquitous yoke of slavery and the other from central africa which has never yet been subjected to european influence european pride has looked with contempt on these african tribes and imagines them destined to hopeless stagnation but the very fact of their having been left to themselves renders them better disposed to receive positivism the first system in which their fetishistic faith has been appreciated as the origin from which the historic evolution of society has proceeded it is probable that the council will have reached its limit of sixty members before the spiritual interregnum in the central regions of humanity has been terminated but even if political reconstruction were to proceed so rapidly in europe as to render all possible assistance to this vast movement 
it is hardly conceivable that the five stages of which it consists can be thoroughly effected within a period of two centuries but however this may be the action of the council will become increasingly valuable not only for its direct influence on the less advanced nations but also and more especially because the proofs it will furnish for the universality of the new religion will strengthen its adherence in the western family but the time when positivism can be brought into direct contact with these preliminary phases is far distant and we need not wait for it the features of the system stand out already with sufficient clearness to enable us to begin at once the work of mental and social renovation for which our revolutionary predecessors so energetically prepared the way they however were blinded to the future by their hatred of the past with us on the contrary social sympathy rests upon the historical spirit and at the same time strengthens it solidarity with our contemporaries is not enough for us unless we combine it with the sense of continuity with former times and while we press on toward the future we lean upon the past every phase of which our religion holds in honor so far from the energy of our progressive movement being hampered by such feelings it is only by doing full justice to the past as no system but ours can do consistently that we can obtain perfect emancipation of thought because we are thus saved from the necessity of making the slightest actual concession to systems which we regard as obsolete understanding their nature and their purpose better than the sectaries who still empirically adhere to them we can see that each was in its time necessary as a preparatory step towards the final system in which all their partial and imperfect services will be combined comparing it especially with the last synthesis by which the western family of nations has been directed it is clear even from the indications given in its prefatory work that the new synthesis is more real more comprehensive and more stable all that we find to admire in the medieval system is developed and matured in positivism it is the only system which can induce the intellect to accept its due position of subordination to the heart we recognize the piety and chivalry of our ancestors who made a noble application of the best doctrine that was possible in their time we believe that were they living now they would be found in our ranks they would acknowledge the decay of their provisional phase of thought and would see that in its present degenerate state it is only a symbol of reaction and a source of discord and now that the doctrine has been shown to rest on a central principle a principle which appeals alike to instinct and to reason we may carry our comparison a step further and convince all clear-seeing and honest minds that it is as superior to formal systems in its influence over the emotions and the imagination as it is from the practical and intellectual aspect under it life whether private or public becomes in a still higher sense than under polytheism a continuous act of worship performed under the inspiration of universal love all our thoughts feelings and actions flow spontaneously to a common centre in humanity our supreme being a being who is real accessible and sympathetic because she is of the same nature as her worshippers though far superior to any one of them the very conception of humanity is a condensation of the whole mental and social history of man for it implies the irrevocable extinction of theology and of war both of which are incompatible with uniformity of belief and with cooperation of all the energies of the race the spontaneous morality of the emotions is restored to its due place and philosophy poetry and polity are thereby regenerated each is placed in its due relation to the others and is consecrated to the study the praise and the service of humanity 
the most relative and the most perfectible of all beings science passes from the analytic to the synthetic stage being entrusted with the high mission of founding an objective basis for man's action on the laws of the external world and of man's nature a basis which is indispensable to control the oscillation of our opinions the versatility of our feelings and the instability of our purposes poetry assumes at last its true social function and will henceforth be preferred to all other studies by idealizing humanity under every aspect it enables us to give fit expression to the gratitude we owe to her both publicly and as individuals and thus it becomes a source of the highest spiritual benefit but amidst the pleasures that spring from the study and the praise of humanity it must be remembered that positivism is characterized always by reality and utility and admits of no degeneration into asceticism or quietism the love by which it is inspired is no passive principle while stimulating reason and imagination it does so only to give a higher direction to our practical activity it was in practical life that the positivist spirit first arose extending thence to the sphere of thought and ultimately to the moral sphere the grand object of human existence is the constant improvement of the natural order that surrounds us of our material condition first subsequently of our physical intellectual and moral nature and the highest of these objects is moral progress whether in the individual in the family or in society it is on this that human happiness whether in private or public life principally depends political art then when subordinated to morality becomes the most essential of all arts it consists in concentration of all human effort upon the service of humanity in accordance with the natural laws which regulate her existence the great merit of ancient systems of polity of the roman system especially was that precedence was always given to public interests every citizen cooperated in the manner and degree suited to those early times but there were no means of providing proper regulation for domestic life in the middle ages when catholicism attempted to form a complete system of morality private life was made the principal object all our affections were subjugated to a most beneficial course of discipline in which the inmost springs of vice and virtues were reached but owing to the inadequacy of the doctrines on which the system rested the solution of the problem was incoherent the method by which catholicism controlled the selfish propensities was one which turned men away from public life and concentrated them on interests which were at once chimerical and personal the immediate value of this great effort was that it brought about for the first time a separation between moral and political power which in the systems of antiquity had always been confounded but the separation was due rather to the fact of circumstances than to any conscious efforts and it could not be fully carried out because it was incompatible with the spirit of the catholic doctrine and with the military character of society woman sympathized with catholicism but the people never supported it with enthusiasm and it soon sank under the encroachments of the temporal power and the degeneracy of the priesthood positivism is the only system which can renew this premature effort and bring it to a satisfactory issue combining the spirit of antiquity with that of catholic feudalism it proposes to carry out the political program put forward by the convention positive religion brings before us in a definite shape the noblest of human problems the permanent preponderance of social feeling over self-love as far as the exceeding imperfection of our nature enables us to solve it it would be solved by calling our home affections into continuous action affections which stand halfway between self-love and universal sympathy 
in order to consolidate and develop this solution positivism lays down the philosophical and social principle of separation of theoretical from practical power theoretical power is consultative it directs education and supplies general principles practical power directs action by special and imperative rules all the elements of society that are excluded from political government become guarantees of the preservation of this arrangement the priests of humanity which are the systematic organs of the moderating power will always find themselves supported in their attempts to modify the governing power by women and by the people but to be supported they must be men who in addition to the intellectual power necessary for their mission have the moral qualities which are yet more necessary who combine that is the tenderness of women with the energy of the people the first guarantee for the possession of such qualities is a sacrifice of political authority and even of wealth then we may at least hope to see the new religion taking the place of the old because it will fulfill in a more perfect way the mental and social purpose for which the old religion existed monotheism will lapse like polytheism and fetishism into the domain of history and will like them be incorporated into the system of universal commemoration in which humanity will render its due homage to all her predecessors it is not then merely on the ground of speculative truth that positivists would urge all those who are still halting between two opinions to choose between the absolute and the relative between the fruitless search for causes and the solid study of laws between submission to arbitrary wills and submission to demonstrable necessities it is for feeling still more than for reason to make the decision for upon it depends the establishment of a higher form of social life monotheism in western europe is now as obsolete and injurious as polytheism was fifteen centuries ago the discipline in which its moral value principally consisted has long since decayed and consequently the sole effect of its doctrine which has been so extravagantly praised is to degrade the affections by unlimited desires and to weaken the character by servile terrors it supplied no field for the imagination and forced it back upon polytheism and fetishism which under theology form the only possible foundation for poetry the pursuits of practical life were never sincerely promoted by it and they advanced only by evading or resisting its influence the noblest of all practical pursuits that of social regeneration is at the present time in direct opposition to it for by its vague notion of providence it prevents men from forming a true conception of law a conception necessary for true prevision on which all wise intervention must be based sincere believers in christianity will soon cease to interfere with the management of a world where they profess themselves to be pilgrims and strangers the new supreme being is no less jealous than the old and will not accept the servants of two masters but the truth is that the more zealous theological partisans whether royalists or aristocrats or democrats have now for a long time been insincere god to them is but the nominal chief of a hypocritical conspiracy a conspiracy which is even more contemptible than it is odious their object is to keep the people from all great social improvements by assuring them that they will find compensation for their miseries in an imaginary future life the doctrine is already falling into discredit among the working classes everywhere throughout the west especially in paris all theological tendencies whether catholic protestant or deist really serve to prolong and aggravate our moral anarchy because they hinder the diffusion of that social sympathy and breadth of view without which we can never attain fixity of principle and regularity of life every subversive scheme now afloat has either originated in monotheism or has received its sanction 
even catholicism has lost its power of controlling revolutionary extravagance in some of its own most distinguished members it is for the sake of order therefore even more than of progress that we call on all those who desire to rise above their present disastrous state of oscillation in feeling and opinion to make a distinct choice between positivism and theology for there are now but two camps the camp of reaction and anarchy which acknowledges more or less distinctly the direction of god the camp of construction and progress which is wholly devoted to humanity the being upon whom all our thoughts are concentrated is one whose existence is undoubted we recognize that existence not in the present only but in the past and even in the future and we find it always subject to one fundamental law by which we are enabled to conceive of it as a whole placing our highest happiness in universal love we live as far as it is possible for others and this in public life as well as in private for the two are closely linked together in our religion a religion clothed in all the beauty of art and yet never inconsistent with science after having thus exercised our powers to the full and having given a charm and sacredness to our temporary life we shall at last be for ever incorporated into the supreme being of whose life all noble natures are necessarily partakers it is only through the workers of humanity that we can feel the inward reality and inexpressible sweetness of this incorporation it is unknown to those who being still involved in theological belief have not yet been able to form a clear conception of the future and have never experienced the feeling of pure self-sacrifice end of a general view of positivism by august comte translated by john henry bridges